Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. For a primer on these Ethiopian characters, newcomers may start with the prologue by Manuel de Goes. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit Ethiopia.com. That's U T H I O P I A dot com. In those days, the penitent monks were profligate with their own blood. There were such that elected to perch in trees with the birdies, or those that sought oblivion in rivers with the fishes, while others chose to stand on one leg a dozen years or more. Zeta Jacob effusively congratulated them all, before taking another slurp from his piping hot coffee, all the while sighing, Yes, yes, it's true that it costs me dearly. Yet, what is one to do? I must persevere. And he continued sipping the bitter draught, all the while making a show of scrunching up his face in agony. The Apocrypha of Zeliakob Hugo Pratt Ch. Hugo's family Weavers, linked back by a tenuous thread to the Yorkshire mills, reached the north of Italy by means of a prolonged stay in the textile factories of Lyon. The child, Hugo, will later remember the waifs and the brill cream boys carousing about in gold lacquer's gondoliers, the iridescent slicks that graced the turgid waters of the Grand Canal are as shiny as a poor girl's dowry. The family is granted Italian citizenship just in time to take part in the anachronistic episode, which will be called, for a very short time, Africa Orientale Italiana. Hugo's father is more Catholic than the Pope, and, seeking to demonstrate how Italian he is, volunteers for service in Abyssinia. Venice, its ghetto, its vaporetto, and its sinking palaces disappears in the mists of the Laguna. How beautiful it is, seen from afar. How beautiful it is, in a sketch. Oh, to be on a steamboat, with Italian sailors, proud of their new empire, and a shipload of whores. The Italian colonial authorities are upset by instances of fraternization between their troops and the natives. Who can blame the rowdy Calabrian cannon fodder? In the propaganda carried out to drum up support for their invasion of Ethiopia from Eritrea, an Italian colony for 60 years already, postcards of Ethiopian maidens have been distributed by the thousands throughout the garrisons of the peninsula. The child Hugo boards a train in a stifly Red Sea port where they speak French. As they chug deep into the desert, he sets his eyes on the Bedou, that Rudyard Kipling called Fuzzy Wuzzy, and that Hugo himself will immortalize decades later, calling them Beni Amer, an artist's license, as these Beni Amer nomadize much further north, in the wastelands of Port Sudan, the country of the Mahdi. Hugo falls asleep on this train as it passes through the empty canvas. When Hugo awakes, he may still be a child, he immediately grasps that he has been born again. The fresh air is scented with odors redolent of pulmonary rubs. Hugo's father smiles and puts him in the picture. This is our new home, Addis Ababa. We call it Eucalyptopolis because of the abundance of these Australian gum trees. The child Hugo goggles at it all. He takes a particular shine to the soldiers in their creased uniforms, a love he will hold his whole life, drawing military outfits the world over. Behold the glory of a weekday on Avenida Victor Emmanuel, 
dromedaries loaded with elephant tusks, mules bearing coffee bags from Kaffa, from Harar, and from Ilubabur. There are the native multitudes that his father designates by the official Negroes, Abyssinians, Hugo himself calls them, the barefoot priests, the beggars with their leprous stumps, the solemn majesty of the women, brown, black, golden, or coffee-colored, their color always set off by the white netella in which they draped themselves. Police officers in jodhpurs and brass button coats lashing the crowds with their buffalo giraffes. He was tired of Addis, is tired of life, Hugo's father remarks. A multitude of tongues and of mores. Afternoon tea will be taken in the bourgeois salon of an Amara nobleman, while the morning was spent with Gurage laborers applying paint to the palisade. The house staff, all starched uniforms, a frilly ribbon in their hair for the women, a bow tie for the men, bright red in each case, are very black, and are flatter face than those of the occupants of the grand houses, Hugo's father declares. It is for these oppressed peoples that we Italians have come to free the slaves of the despot Haile Selassie. Does his father believe this? Hugo speaks Amharic. He will later recount how, meeting an Ethiopian by chance in a bar in Genoa, decades later, the words will readily roll off his tongue. He boasts how he lost his virginity to an Amara girl called Miriam. How servant, playmate, we do not know. The shadow of war is drawing closer, even here in Hugo's Eucalyptopolis. The real war, not the cruel operetta that the Italians carried out in 1936, in which they rained ordnance down upon the barefoot Ethiopians from airplanes, choking them with toxic gas. One morning, his father, a colonial bureaucrat, is called up to the front, where all reinforcements are needed, even shy paper pushers, to so stave off the advance of the Tommies. The father, offers the child an illustrated version of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island and imparts to Hugo as he walks out the door. You too, my son, one day you shall find your Treasure Island. It is the last time that Hugo will see his father. He will have his whole life to meditate upon these words, turning them over a million times in his head. Is it a hidden message? were a meaningless phrase said without thinking. Hugo's father will die of malaria and is buried near the town of Harar. Then it is Hugo and the rest of his family who are interned in a British camp for civilians in the town of Diridawa. Three years spent in a camp of 4,000 women prisoners, and I was a boy of 16, he will later muse. The joy of it. Finally, there comes the time to leave, for good, the return to a Venice pullulating with G.I.s and to the illustrious future that we know. Hugo travelled much, knew many women and many more lands. There will even be an Ethiopian album one day outlining this phantasmagoric Abyssinia that will abide in him till the very end. Hugo, the thrill seeker, reposes on a lake shore in Switzerland. Curiously, the album skirts his vibrant eucalyptopolis, the tonic high plateaus, and all that made the real Ethiopia, the one that Hugo had known so well. Instead, the drawings hover about the margins of the Abyssinian Empire, and the action focuses on the Ogaden Desert, as if an illustrator had invented a luxuriant border for his comic strip and decided to leave the main page blank.